first challenges we set ourselves on Game of Thrones was to make sure you could see any character that you don't know in close-up against a very plain background. And based on what he or she was wearing, the colors, the cut of the fabric, their haircuts, you would know instantly what world you were in. Well, Michelle Clapton is just, you know, it's, it's impossible to imagine the series without a brilliant costume designer, and I think she outdid herself. It's been the hardest season so far for all of us, I think. It's just been challenging in so many areas, just the sheer amount we've had to make. You usually get a little synopsis first, so already you know where you're going. It's all to do with how keen the players are. So you sort of you start planning your head who you want the big pushes for. With this kiss, I pledge my love. sort of was challenging in as much as there were so many costumes to make. I mean, this is Joffrey's wedding, and so it just had to be more opulent. With the crowns, I wanted, you know, Joffrey has his Baratheon antlers, as usual, and uh, Marjorie had her crown of um, roses, but with Joffrey's, it's the sort of roses entwining and beginning to sort of wrap around and control him. It was sort of try and represent the idea of what they were hoping as a family to happen. It's just been incredible. It's been a real royal wedding. The wedding dress is a piece of haute couture, had many, many fittings. It's just, it's stunning, and it deserves to be on a catwalk. Marjorie's gown is amazing. It just fits Natalie like a glove. She, she looks beautiful in it. The fit is so difficult, because with Marjorie, we always try and miss pieces out, so, you know, it's sort of backless. Just the structuring of it is quite tricky. It works beautifully, so much so that Alex said he's never, ever changed a shot for a costume designer before, but because it looks so good, he did. <laughs> to us all. Cersei is pulling back a little bit. She's not the sort of powerhouse that she was, and it was just I wanted her to be sort of slightly quieter, very beautiful, but just not sort of rocking the red so much. It's just this sort of slightly muted look to her. Come, Tywin, let us celebrate young love. Tywin actually does wear red, which is very rare for him. I think in this moment, this is sort of securing up the throne. And so he's pulled out the red. So I try and play with colors and try and push people forward and back and trying to show how sort of patriotic they are to their family just by sort of what they wear. I mean, I find it very difficult, really, that here we are in King's Landing, enjoying this wonderful climate. And we're all dressed like this. <laughs> Where's my long flowing robe that, you know, I can waft around and get the wind up my skirt. The Marjorie Tyrell who walks into the scepter fortnight from now will inspire a thousand songs. I suppose I wanted the Tyrell to look very much of a group. I tried to formalize it with the sort of rose fabric because it's the fabric of their family and this was being done for family. This is nice. I, I like this, the, the seams in here kind of match the shirt. It's a lot thicker quality so it feels, I think last year's um, costume felt a bit um, a little bit airy, you know, but this is nicer. It's more, you know, it's more robust, and we've got this nice waffle sleeve. The brooch, it's still going strong, pointy. I keep on like catching my uh, fingers on it. My lords, my ladies, I give you the war of the five kings. And then, of course, the, the centerpiece of the entertainment, the amazing, the war of the five kings that Joffrey has gleefully choreographed himself. I was drawing them, I was sort of laughing to myself, and I sent them off, and David and Dan came back and said, yeah, yeah, we really like them, they're really good, but Ren is a bit dull, you know, how can we make him look a bit more Renly-ish? And I had actually drawn him on a horse, and I thought, okay, well, I'll draw him riding Loras. I think Michelle had a lot of fun with it, and it was great to see the reaction of the cast when they saw it for the first time. The costumes imitate the costumes we've already seen on those characters, and at the same time, they're kind of played for comic effect. They almost become like miniature floats in, a, in some sort of very perverse parade. She designed these costumes for the dwarves based on what David and Dan wrote in the script. And the costumes were so brilliant that we immediately went like, no one can see these, they've got to be hidden. And we didn't want the cast to see them because we wanted the cast to see the dwarves for the first time on the first take. When they came out, I, I, myself, I was just like, wow, these, these guys are excellent. Like, they, they nailed it straight away. It's always a joy as an actor to actually be <laughs> genuinely reacting spontaneously. It was perfect because it's Joffrey gives birth to this idea, and so it's, you know, fittingly idiotic and, and insulting. The dwarf costumes for this joust are incredible and really rude, but funny. They seem to invent things, you know, ways to make things work. We had a special sort of costume maker come in who sort of understood mechanics of it, how we had to make it work, and she was great. It was a really good, fun project. A work of art, really. Craftsmanship is exquisite. I like it so much, you're welcome to chop off your own hand and take it.
I think part of him finds it ridiculous. You know, couldn't you have given me something which was practical? That's one of my favorite pieces this season, actually. Yeah, it was really, really interesting to do and, and a really hard thing to do. Because Cersei commissioned it, I wanted it to have a sort of beauty to it. So we actually took um, the reference from her armor that she wore last year. And we took the patterning from that and then applied it to the hand. Because he could take it on and off himself, I think eventually Nikolai sort of, well, quite quickly got used to it. And it took a month to make. We did a cast and then he had to make an iron hand based on Jamie's cast and then he hammered the uh, brass around it and it was amazing. Hello. Ilaria Sands' style is very different from anything else we've seen, and so it's quite revealing, and it's actually a sandwash silk. So it has a lovely flow. It's almost like a weightiness to it. Lord Hand, Lady Cersei, Ilaria Sand. My lord, my lady. I can't say I've ever met a Sand before. Bastards are born of passion, aren't they? We don't despise them in Dorne. It's a southern climate. It's a very luxurious kingdom. It's a world of pleasure seekers. So we went for things that were very loose and very sensual, and also were inspired a little bit by Indian or Persian outfits. Just looking at some of the fabrics that Michelle chose, they bespeak a world of luxury and sensual pleasure. And again, that's a, a new element for us. Quite frankly, I am the one who's dressed most suitably for Croatia. Everyone else is in heavy brocade and leather and stockings, wool, and I'm like in silk floating about. Everyone's like, oh my God. They, they were really jealous of the way I was dressed. <laughs> There's so much detail in all her costumes that at one point she said, I want a leather buckle as part of the halter neck. And um, I said, oh, but don't worry about it because we won't see it. I've got long hair and a big wig. She said, I don't care. I want it. I think it's, it's erotic. She had a really lovely, um, for the wedding, a sort of chained headpiece which I just thought, that, God, it's such a great look. It's this thing of trying to find new areas of how people should look, because we've obviously done so much now. Well, what Michelle's done is so brilliant, because she's kind of like, there's something about Oberyn that's very other, as far as King's Landing is concerned. And she really manifests that in, in his look. It's quite an Indian feel, like crossover coat. Pedro just wore it brilliantly, because it's actually quite a feminine look, but he wears it in a really masculine way big sashes and belts. And the colors, it's also orange, like burnt oranges and yellows and golds. It's a much more permissive land, you know, in terms of costume. What they wear to a wedding would be considered appropriate in the Riverlands. It's quite fun just to start a look, and then next year we can really go into it. But I think it will have a really big Indian influence. You raped my sister. You murdered her. You killed her children. Say it now, and we can make this quick. <laughs> <laughs> And then obviously his armor, which I, get, I think is my favorite armor. Um, and it was inspired by a metal armor I found, which had the sort of black and white sort of check on it. And then that obviously with the viper, it turned into leather. And then we made a stamp. Then we made lots of stamps. And we actually sort of created this sort of snake skin. It's, it's sort of like armor that you can really move around in. And so she made something that really sort of physically represented movement. Pedro was very, very good because he had actually two or three moves to every one of the others. The mountain was amazing. The whole shoot was so hot, it was like fighting in a walk. And his armor itself, I know he's the first strongest man in the world, but it's still very, very heavy. Once we've made it, we then do tests to see how it works. And actually, it was, it was a little heavy, so we actually stripped out one of the layers. And in the end, we just actually had to one layer. And, and then it's funny how it, it works for both of you in the end. You know, you go, oh, I don't want to wreck my cards. But actually, you're not wrecking it. You're making it work. I hope I got your measurements right. I'm very proud owner of a new costume, which I'm very excited about, which um, allows me to be, hopefully, uh, a bit more dynamic and to be able to be more involved in all of the fights. Yet again, the costume department have excelled themselves. Brienne's was one of the most challenging, just to sort of get all the elements in place. I mean, we cut out each square in leather and we embossed it with her sigil and then built up this costume and then we hand laid on chainmail. Jamie, I don't think, has a great deal of imagination. So 
We didn't think he'd come up with anything particularly fanciful. It's just made by better armourers, being King's Landing. You know, I don't know where she got it made before, but this time it, it just, just has a little bit more polish. It was Tyrion. He killed him. He told me he would. Cersei goes obviously instantly into black. She has a black velvet dagger print dress. Marjorie, on the other hand, goes into mourning, but she'll go into the formal Tyrell mourning, which is the black rose. She's already beginning to set her sights on Tommen. So it's a forced mourning for her. And whereas with Cersei, it's an absolutely heartbroken mourning. Come with me, Brandon Stark. Come with me or die with him. The Children of the Forest look brilliant. I love the idea that they're, they're so small, but they're completely deadly. And they look so kind of childlike. I always thought they should be really old children. Personally, I took my lead from Jojen and Mirren. Their costumes have always been on the verge of being quite organic. And so the costumes that I've made are out of feathers and leaves. So it's all sort of greeny, huge curls all over the place, but in a sort of very sort of tree-like root fashion. They look in some ways similar to wildlings, but um, they look more ancient. They look like more of an ancient race. They don't have any way of fashioning clothes. How would they do that? So it's almost like, it's supposed to look like they rolled in it. And there's a beautiful lichen. It's just sort of little bits of mold and lichen and things growing on them. They're like little trees, <laughs> trees with feathers on. David and Dan say, you know, now that the White Walkers know they're in danger, that they, there is obviously something that can kill them, that they should be armoured. I went back to samurai a little bit. I looked at the way they tie things and put things together. I also looked at Egyptian. It has these sort of very sharp, cut-out pieces. It's almost like a fender, like a car fender. It's quite unusual, I think. We wanted to kind of evolve the White Walker look. He is of a group of almost ageless creatures. It's an interesting mix between something frightening, obviously, but also regal, like something aristocratic about him. We wanted a distinction from the other White Walkers that we've seen. And we went back and forth for a long time until we hit upon something that was, if anything, moving in a more human direction while maintaining a generally horrific look. Welcome to the Iron Bank. Please, sit. Once we decided we were using the Netherlands in the 16th and 17th century as the model for the buildings of Bravos, Michelle then picked up on that and designed the costumes for Bravos along the same lines. I quite like the idea of the banking as a dirty business. Once they come into the bank, they put the sabot on because it's where they're working. And the men are in these very pleated skirts and metallic ruffs. From the moment we read about the Iron Bank and Tycho Nestoris, the, the representative of the Iron Bank, we loved it because it was such a it was such an atypical element. Banking it doesn't really factor into most high fantasy, but it's very modern. I mean, it's very, the lines are very clean and Dutch Protestant, and the way they dress is, is inspired by the Dutch Golden Age, and they're a bit more advanced than most of the people in Westeros, which is perhaps why they're in charge of everything. What can we do for you, Lord Stannis? This is Stannis of the House Baratheon, king of the Andals and the First Men, lord of the Seven Kingdoms and protector of the realm. I don't think Stannis is a sort of Joffrey. He's not trying to show that he's king. He just believes he is, and this is his look, and this is what it, it, what it always will be. I really enjoyed doing Marine. It's just much more opulent and wealthy. It has a colour range that's greater and brighter. And Danny, once she's there and has her own penthouse, you actually start seeing her dressing for certain occasions. So she's very formal when she's in the hall. She wears really soft wraps and some quite wafty things in her apartment. We see Missande sort of growing closer to her and adapting a similar style. She's developing a, a wardrobe and a taste now. We're still keeping it to blues and silvers. I think it's nice too. I think it just gives such a different look to her. Will you pardon me, my lord? I'd like to visit the Cotswood. Of course, of course. Prayer can be helpful. I don't pray anymore. It's the only place I can go where people don't talk to me. Sansa has gone back to mauves. It's a very plain dress. It just looks really beautiful as well with this, the pale blue necklace that I wanted, that I designed for the for the deed. It belonged to my mother and her mother before her. Take it, wear it. Let my name have one more moment in the sun before it 
disappears from the world. I looked actually at lots of Art Deco and Art Nouveau necklaces. I was just inspired by them, actually. And even Madras as well was inspired by the same period. It was actually really exciting. I very rarely designed jewellery. I'm most excited for, like, my big change with the hair and the costume, the moment where I go dark and kind of gothic. We call her Dark Sansa, actually. You know, when you see her coming down the stairs with her hair dyed dark brown, wearing the black dress, it was incredible to see how she's evolved as an actress and, and gone from being a kid to um, this young, powerful woman. It's one of the best performances of the season. Shall we go? And as usual on Game of Thrones, we try and, and make it so that she really could have made this costume herself. She has this necklace, which in, in a way is her needle. And it's a black circle with a chain, and on the end is a very long point. In my head again, I just sort of try and... I wanted something, not just a necklace, something a bit stronger, but she's not the sort of person to have a sword. It's a little play on what she's known for and, and how we, it shifts into something stronger. People die at their dinner tables, they die in their beds, they die squatting over their chamber pots. And don't worry about your death. Worry about your life. He just becomes more opulent, you know. It's his look, but it just gets bigger and grander, and he carries himself. It's actually, his cloak is incredibly heavy, but he likes, and it sort of gives him this bearing. Open it. From this day until your last day, you are Ramsay Bolton, son of Roose Bolton, Warden of the North. Ramsay's look does evolve. It, he, he tends to look more like a Bolton because he's finally acknowledged by his father. And there's obviously a step in that direction. He's, he's proud to be the son. Well, I've heard that I have the, the, the most heavy costume of, of, of all. But of course, when you're, when you're fighting in the rain, it, 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 it gets more and more heavy. <laughs> I think there are six wildling tribes now. I think we've made most, the fens we've made most, I think we've made, we've made quite a lot of them. And we worked with makeup because the scarification on the heads is reflected in the patterning on the discs. This is all leather and this is all handmade. I asked them to try it many, many times to get comfortable in this. I've never had so much fun getting completely wet and dirty. It just, it's incredible. This costume, is one of the most incredible things I've ever worn. All the materials you see here, the leather, the, the owl's nest on my shoulder for my trusty partner here, it's real wood. It's time. You have to do so little acting because so much of it is actually real. If you're an actor, certain things like costume help you when you feel powerful, you feel potent. So it's interesting how things like that can, can inform you just within the space of a couple of seconds of, of interacting with it. I, I mean, I just, I just really enjoy the process of you know, designing and making, and I really like the team of people we have here and growing with it. And I think, I think that does happen here a lot. It's the efforts of, of dozens or hundreds of people are what make this possible. We're just very, very fortunate to work with a bunch of people this talented and this dedicated and this easy to be around. <laughs>